My name is Miles Cranmer. I'm a graduate student at Princeton. Um, I work at the intersection of, of physics and machine learning. I, I usually apply uh, machine learning to different problems in astrophysics and also uh, kind of develop new methods uh, that might be used for different problems. So today I want to talk to you about this method we've developed for taking a deep neural network and kind of converting it into a, a simple analytic expression. So, so this is work with uh, these collaborators. Um, <coughs> so let me just start by, if, if you remember nothing else from this talk, I want you to remember uh, these three points. So the first is uh, symbolic regression. It's, it's kind of like, it's, it's an underused machine learning model, but it's, it's very, very interpretable, and it's very good at doing physics problems. So symbolic regression is a machine learning algorithm where you basically learn to model your data set by searching the space of analytic expressions. So one can convert a, a deep neural network into an analytic expression with the technique I'm going to show you today. Um, and this, I think this represents a very strong way of interpreting a neural network. So I, th I think a lot of traditional explainable AI techniques, they look at uh, kind of indirect interpretability, kind of seeing what the model's doing. But this is a very strong way of actually converting your model into a fully interpretable uh, equivalent model uh, that you can work with, so like a simple analytic expression. So the, the last thing I want to say is that I think our method also represents a, it's a way of doing symbolic regression on high dimensional data, where symbolic regression would typically be uh, completely intractable. So what is symbolic regression? It is a machine learning algorithm. So, you, so it's, uh, we usually do it for regression problems. We want to fit uh, the relation between an input set of features and output set of features. So uh, except the, the basis, so traditionally machine learning, you have some model that depends on many parameters, and you would fit those parameters. Uh, symbolic regression, you're actually fitting this space of analytic expressions. So, uh, so you, you search over all the space of analytic expressions for this function f uh, that, that models this relationship. So, OK, if you have uh, this curve, so x-axis is your input, y-axis is the output, you want to find a model that could fit this. In symbolic regression, what you would do is you would say, uh, you would try basically different functional forms. So you say, does cosine fit this? No. Does sine fit this? No. Uh, you keep trying, you get to exponential of x. So that's closer. And now what you do is you kind of, uh, you reward that expression, and you would basically start mutating on that expression, and you would eventually find exponent over x, x over 2, which is the right expression. Um, so, so, so why do we want to do this? So if you think about it, many, many rules in, in physics and in natural sciences in general are kind of accurately described by simple symbolic expressions. So this is already true. So this is some cheat sheet that I pulled off of Google uh, for physics, Physics 101. And you can see that so many different expressions um, in this cheat sheet are just simple analytic equations, and they are extremely precise at describing these relationships. So I think I really think the question is, like, like, why don't we use this basis? It's such a good basis for physics. It's so interpretable. Um, it's so concise and easy to compute. Really, why don't we use this as a basis in machine learning? That's, a, that's what I see the motivation for symbolic regression. So there's this really nice article by Eugene Wigner. He basically says, uh, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. Um, we should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in future research and that it will extend for better or for worse to our pleasure, even though perhaps also to our bafflement, um, to wide branches of learning. So in this article, he points out kind of all the weird connections between different scientific fields. like like pi appears in the formula for a circle, and it also appears in a normal distribution. There's a, there's a lot of weird connections in math, and it, it really seems like these analytic expressions are just a powerful basis um, for describing our universe. 
So, okay, still why? So concise, interpretable, um, you can apply centuries of mathematical analysis to kind of detect failures in your model ahead of time. And, um, and another thing we've, we've also seen in our work is that they may generalize better to out of distribution data than the neural network they were extracted from for physical problems. Um, and this, this might be due to neural networks with ReLU activations, maybe you only get like linear extrapolation, whereas um, when you convert to this analytic basis, you might get kind of better extrapolation properties. Okay, so, so how does symbolic regression actually work? So if I have, uh, if I have this expression, x1, x4 plus cos x2 minus 0.32, I would represent this in a genetic algorithm uh, package for symbolic regression as a, as a binary tree. So you can decompose it into a binary tree. Um, so this is, so my package PICER, this is how it represents an equation. Um, other packages like Cindy, you would fit a sparse sum of a basis set of functional forms and kind of find a sparse set of coefficients. Um, you can also do this genetic algorithm strategy. So in the genetic algorithm strategy, the way it works is you have this binary tree represent an equation and you apply different mutation operators from genetic algorithms. So like you take your, uh, your multiplication symbol, you mutate it to a division symbol. Maybe you take your cosine and you just delete it from the tree. Maybe you take your x2 and you mutate it to x, or you take your x1 and mutate it to x2. Maybe you take a constant and like randomly increase it by 20%, decrease it by 20%. Maybe you swap the sign. So you have all these random mutations to um, explore expression space. Um, so so I, I use regularized evolution in, in my PICER package. So in this case, you fit um, some small subsample of a population of equations, and you would find the fittest member of that subsample, so the, the equation that best fits your data. And you, you mutate it. So in this case, you're mutating the, you're mutating the constant, and um, you would basically look for the oldest member of your population and replace it with, your, with this new expression. And you just repeat this, thousands and thousands of times. And this is a way of kind of, uh, if, uh, kind of more efficiently exploring equation space than just a brute force search. Um, so you would score this and repeat. Um, so, so how can I actually do symbolic regression? So, there's, so if you know like your equation is gonna be a sum of known functional forms, I think Sydney is a, is a faster approach. Um, it's a really good approach for finding a sparse set of coefficients in front of a basis set of functional forms. When you, when you don't know your functional basis, or you, you think it could be like a very nested, nasty expression, um, I think a good choice might be PICER, which is my package, which uses um, genetic algorithms. So they both have kind of areas of, of strength. Um, so the way PICER works is uh, it's a Python package with a Julia backend. So if I have this input data set with, with 100 data points and five features and say my true equation is like 2 cos x3 plus x0 squared minus 2, I would put that into PICER, declare what binary operators are allowed, declare what unary operators are allowed. I can also define a custom operator um, that it can use. And I, I let it do this genetic algorithm search. Um, and in the end, so this one is actually really fast because you don't have that many features, you don't have that many operators, um, so it can find this in like 10 minutes um, just by kind of applying genetic algorithms to search this space. Okay, so, so something, something really important with symbolic regression is that um, you get, so they're compact, you get uh, explicit interpretations, they generalize well, but they are terrible at high dimensional problems. And this is because you're dealing with uh, combinatorics. You're, like if you count the number of possible equations, there's just like a factorial number, like factorial over the number of features. So it, it blows up very, very fast. So it's, it's bad at high dimensional problems. Whereas say deep learning is kind of like, uh, it's precisely complements this. You are efficient at learning in high dimensional spaces, but you are uninterpretable, bad at generalization. 
Um, and so you can see how these kind of complement each other. So what, what we were really interested in is, can we combine both? Can we take the strengths of both of these and maybe uh, use deep learning to kind of find a better symbolic expression? So this is what we did. So we, uh, in our approach, you basically train a neural network to solve your problem, because they're really good at high dimensional problems. You train a neural network to uh, model some data set. Um, and you basically want to take that trained model and try to distill it into a simple analytic expression. So you're basically, rather than fitting the equation on the raw data itself, you're fitting the expressions to the neural network. And then the nice part about this is uh, you, can, you can train the neural network with different regularizations that causes it to be uh, easier for the symbolic regression to kind of distill. So like um, the way you actually want to do this is you structure your neural network so that um, it's built up of small internal functions. And each internal function you want to have operate on a low dimensional space. And since it operates on a low dimensional space, that means that symbolic regression becomes tractable. Because now you're in the low dimensional regime, um, and you can actually run symbolic regression on the neural network. You, you kind of treat the neural network as like a, the internal functions like a data, data generating process, and you try to approximate it. Um, so as an example, like if, you, if your internal function in your neural network is like y equals the sum of g of x, i, where g is your learned, maybe it's like a multi-layer perceptron. In this example, um, you, would, you would regularize g to, be, to have a sparse output. So you want g to live in a low dimensional space, be like a low dimensional function. And then it's really easy to kind of, you want to kind of rip out g of your model. You like rip it out, and then you try to fit symbolic expressions to it. So another example, um, this is actually, this is a, this is very similar to kind of like a graph net. Um, you have this, this one multilayer perceptron that you sum over your data set. So you're summing the encodings of your data set. And then you map that sum in the original node through a different multilayer perceptron. So in this example, <laughs> you would want both G and F to live in low dimensional spaces. Because then it's, it's easy uh, to distill them into a symbolic expression. OK, so, so another way of seeing our method is you want, to <coughs> you want to design a neural network such that it has separable internal functions inside of it. So rather than kind of huge uh, latent spaces, you want, to have, uh, s you want to distill smaller latent spaces and have several internal functions. And when you do this, and when you train it with a uh, sparsity regularization on the latent spaces, um, then you can try to approximate those internal functions with symbolic regression. Um, so you approximate those internal functions, and then you compose those symbolic expressions uh, using, those, using the internal structure. So like if you have some pools inside your network, you would have those some pools inside the extracted equation, too. So you want to compose those symbolic expressions. And in the end, you're left with a symbolic model that is equivalent to your neural network. Um, so consider like a graph neural network. So this is a single message passing step graph network. You have your uh, function g, which is like maybe a multilayer perceptron, takes the sending node, or sorry, that's the receiving node. The sending node is inputs and it outputs some message, you sum pool those messages over the receiving, for the receiving node, and then you pass that into a second function, which takes that summed message, the current node state, and maps it into a new node state. So in this example, you would want G to have a low dimensional uh, input space and output space. Um, so uh, <coughs> you would kind of regularize that during training to achieve that goal, and then it's very easy to do symbolic regression on it. So uh, we did this for many different n-body systems, 
we have like simple particles interacting with springs or maybe gravitational laws. Um, you try to predict their dynamics with a graph network and you, you encourage this low dimensional representation and then you apply symbolic regression to this function g um, and you end up with, you find the analytic expression you find is actually equivalent to the, to the true one from your simulation. So it's a, it's a way of converting this trained graph network into an analytic expression. It ends up being the true expression. So it's very interpretable. Obviously, this would generalize very well because it's literally the true simulator. Um, so I think it's a nice way of doing things. So another way to look at this is kind of like, <laughs> like a graph network has a strong analogy to Newtonian mechanics. So the, the latent space of the messages is kind of like, it's kind of like a force. So you're, you're summing over the uh, sending nodes. It's kind of like you're summing over interacting particles. And that's kind of like you're computing the net force. So basically, uh, when we regularize sparsity in this message domain, we're basically like encouraging it to find the force vector because that's, that's a low dimensional representation. Um, and then your node model might end up being the acceleration. So you would, you would approximate both the edge model, the node model, um, and convert those uh, with symbolic regression into an equation. Okay, so, so we, we tried this for many different uh, data sets. So we have like one over R squared, one over R, spring law. We even have an if statement describing a force law. So this is a really nasty kind of uh, interaction law. Um, and so we can get, we can actually recover those expressions. So we start by generating these simulations of maybe particles connected by springs. So these are different simulations recorded over time. Um, and this is the true force law. <laughs> so we learn to predict these dynamics uh, with a graph network. So you observe and you can see over time they get closer and closer um, to the true dynamics just from the graph network learning this regression problem. Now what we also do is we regularize the internal functions of the graph network to have small dimensional latent spaces. So you see it kind of pushes this so that it puts as much information to as few dimensions as possible. Um, so it, it sparsifies the latent space. So one thing you can do is just fit the forces to those messages. And it turns out that it's actually, those messages are actually a rotation of the true forces. So you can see it's, it's almost a perfect correlation uh, when you have this rotation. So if, if this law is unknown, rather than fitting the force, you would apply symbolic regression. So you would kind of fit these messages, um, and you can see you extract this expression. It's the rotated spring law, um, which is pretty cool. So uh, we, can, we can do this for many different systems. We can recover spring law, one over R squared. We can even recover like nasty discontinuous forces. Um, we also did this with uh, Hamiltonian neural networks. So we have this like Hamiltonian graph network and we can recover the interaction Hamiltonian between two particles, the actual analytic expression, which is pretty cool. Um, so we, we also, so being an astronomer, I, I kind of interested in this technique to, uh, to apply it to astrophysical systems. So we have this, this dark matter simulation, this very kind of, uh, this very large dark matter simulation over many different cosmologies. And we try to basically predict the dark matter overdensity at the center of a dark matter halo. And so we can convert the graph network into an analytic expression. We get this, this cool kind of overdensity expression and it turns out it's more accurate than, than um, kind of the, the most intuitive expression you could write down. So you can see that um, kind of counterintuitively you're dividing by mass where you would expect to multiply by mass. Um, so you can actually, you can start to kind of uh, think about how you would theoretically get this result, which is pretty cool. And you, you, you really can't have that discussion with a normal neural network. You can only really discuss these kind of these scaling relations when you do symbolic regression on your graph network. So it's very interpretable in terms of existing physics. Uh, you get good generalization, which we observed, 
Um, it's, it's, of course, accurate. It's compact. It's a really nice expression. So we did this. We tested this kind of like Wignerian prior idea. So when you convert it into an ex expression, even though it's not the true expression necessarily, because it's like this, this dark matter relation, you would not expect this to be a true relationship because it's, kind of it's kind of just a correlation. Um, but when you actually measure the generalization to out of distribution data um, against the graph network, it destroys the graph network. Like this analytic expression is much better at generalizing to out of distribution data. And I, I think that's something that's really interesting um, as we go forward in developing machine learning for physics. Um, so restatement, you make a neural network. Um, you try to have multiple internal functions that each work on a low dimensional space. You then approximate that uh, function with a symbolic equation. So you can use like uh, Cindy for if you know your basis functions, Picer if you don't. Um, and then you try to compose those symbolic expressions together. And that's kind of an equivalent interpretable model. So, so one thing some people ask us is, is why don't you just do straight symbolic regression? You have this, you have this sum pool. Um, maybe you can learn this expression and this expression simultaneously. The, the problem with this is that um, you square the number of possible equations. It's already a hard problem to do this with symbolic regression um, for just, just one of these equations. Um, but now you're kind of squaring the number because you're fitting them simultaneously. Whereas with the neural network, um, you can fit Z and YI simultaneously very fast just by a chain rule. Um, so you only get two to the nine, two times 10 to the nine possibilities because you fit them separately. Um, so it's, it scales much better. Um, so uh, we, we developed this technique last year. We've been applying it to different um, problems in astrophysics. So one is like finding optimal observables for cosmic voids. You can actually extract a analytic expression for um, the property of a void, which is kind of most, uh, which provides the most information for predicting uh, cosmological properties. So this is with Christina. Um, uh, Pablo and Niel led this really cool work um, where they, they find Newton's law from real solar system data, and they also learn the planetary masses from scratch. So we have to kind of give the masses to the graph network, but they actually can learn the uh, masses, which is really cool. Um, so the, another application is we're trying to apply this graph network approach to fluid dynamics, where you basically train the graph network on some turbulence problem, and then you try to extract the PDEs from the graph network. So obviously, like these are all expressions from the same equation. Um, this is a lot more difficult, so we've, uh, we've been developed some te techniques to get this working. This is with uh, Elaine. Um, this is also kind of a really cool application of this idea. Um, so again, the takeaways are symbolic regression, machine learning algorithm where you can, uh, you can model your data with analytic expressions. So it, it's much more interpretable. It might provide better generalization for physics. Um, you can always kind of convert a deep neural network into an analytic expression with this technique I described. And I think this is a very strong way of interpretation. This also represents a good way of doing symbolic regression on high dimensional data, whereas normal symbolic regression kind of, uh, it, it scales, scales badly. Um, so our code, we have a tutorial online. Uh, Picer, the symbolic regression package I used, um, it's on GitHub as well. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Um, I'm interested to see kind of what applications people do with this uh, technique. Thank you.